Wealth and Beyond podcast. Want to welcome all the listeners to Brian Moore. Welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm good, Andrew. It's good to be back, man. Always a pleasure to see you and always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah, for listeners, it was uh, episode 40. It was one of my most fun of the 70-plus the that we've done on a little bit of what business and you can learn from the Grateful Dead. So we had a, a fun time in, uh, what was that, a few years ago, huh? It feels like it was a little while ago, yeah, yeah. But then again, it's like, you know, anytime you and I get a chance to see one another and talk about music, and in particular, the Grateful Dead, it's always a good time. So it's as if no time passed at all. And with our relaunch of the uh, podcast, as you saw yesterday as we were doing our, our prelim call, uh, you're the first guest in the new studio, which uh, we're going to be talking a lot about music today, but you can see right behind us here, the big guitar that's just hanging out, ready to be played. I love it. I love it. And I love the, uh, I mean, the decor of it is awesome. The dream plan retire uh, sign and the guitar and the books and the wood panel. And it looks like right above your head, there's like an old school transistor radio of sorts it's just the 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 studio looks really 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 well done so congrats we, to you we and appreciate that, that. yeah the attention to detail and uh lexi who's uh, our producer of the show and marketing guru and design of uh the finest details you could see so we're uh, we're super happy super stoked uh so i know you've been pretty busy these last few years in this now post-covid world but uh you know as we talk a a lot of your passion, my passion, a lot of the people that work here at Baintree is, is music and how we can use music to connect both with personally with friends and family. But a lot of what we're going to go through today is how we can use music and connect in the workplace. Yeah, excited to talk about it. I think connection is certainly a topic that uh, has been top of mind for a lot of folks. Uh, I think it was a top of mind pre-pandemic. and the pandemic clearly accelerated. I think, you know, it's that old cliche, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And because so many of us were forced to uh, be in isolation for uh, an extended period of time, it was like, damn, I really miss people. I miss connecting. I miss socializing. And, uh, you know, now that we're hopefully well beyond the pandemic, uh, I think it's still critical. And um, it feels like there's a new I don't know that pandemic's the right word, but a new hot topic of the day in artificial intelligence. And uh, it's got a ton of advantages, no doubt. And yet, you know, I think there's a real concern that many people share, which is, could it become a surrogate for real human connection? Uh, and so it's just, you know, connection is, we're social beings. As, as human beings, we're social creatures. And uh, yeah, so excited to talk about it. And so you've spent most of your career, and we'll talk a little bit about, or a lot about your your, your transition into uh, Anthem and this new, uh, you've always been an entrepreneur, but, you know, background in, in, in your working career has been working with people and becoming a better leader, finding purpose, all of those things. Um, so what, give us a little bit of a background on, you know, your passions in, in the workforce, and then we can step back to a little bit of growing up and how music was an integral part of your life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got really, really lucky, Andrew. Back in, uh, it was late 1999, very early 2000, I had an opportunity to uh, do a bit of a Control-Alt-Delete or a reboot of my career for those who have no idea what the hell Control-Alt-Delete actually does to a computer if you hold down those keys. Uh, and I got hired by a company called Jobbing.com. And at the time you know, the newspapers still dominated recruitment advertising. If you wanted to hire someone or if you needed a job, you'd wait for the Sunday paper and you'd go find find the job. Or if you were an employer, you'd run your, you know, your ad in the Sunday paper. And uh, the internet was obviously still in its infancy and job boards were very, very new. And I just had this really cool opportunity to both be a part of a exciting startup and for the first time in my career um, really begin to understand what separates uh, one company from the other. What's their culture? What's their employer brand? Why would somebody want to go work from one company to the next? 
And I just became fascinated with the people side of business. At the end of the day, the most critical ingredient of any business recipe is it's people. That's my opinion. I think most people would agree. If you don't get the right people, you can have the best business plan in the world, but it's going to be real tough. Um, and so ever since then, I've just been in and around the people side of business. And I love, I love people. I love connecting with people. I love learning about people. And uh, we spend an awful lot of time of our life at work. And I think there's a huge opportunity to make that uh, one of the most high impact value creation experiences, not only because it's how many of us can make money to support our lives, but how we can create connection and build relationships and uh, add a lot of joy and happiness to both uh, those around us as well as ourselves as a result of that investment. And in looking back to how how we grew up in our first years in the workforce, you know, jobbing similar to Monster, but you know, you're young, out of school, and you know, just trying to understand how the leaders that you were working for, how they were trying to motivate and build a culture and and things of that nature. And you know, it's obviously changed quite a bit these last twenty years. You know, we kind of grew up in that analog, and now digital space that we're in, but a lot of those that are in the workforce now, uh, they weren't in the analog, right? They weren't just running out and playing and, you know, didn't have, we, we grew up with the phones and we, you know, but for us, you know, one of the critical pieces was the experience, right? And so when we think about experiences, both personally and growing up and then in the workplace, you know, it all always for, for, it comes back to, to music, right? Music, emotions and bringing back the smells and the different things of both good and bad, right? It can be, you know, the, the happiest times and the saddest times. So, you know, looking at, as you've seen corporations over the years, you've been part of different ones. I mean, what have you seen lagging that, that, that you thought that this would be instrumental in trying to, to rebuild a culture and, and help build deeper relationships with people that are maybe more distant now because of technology? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is, you know, I remember my first job after I graduated from school and this was even before jobbing. I was in the workforce for, you know, four or five years before I joined jobbing and had this sort of awakening to the people side of the business. And, um, you know, I think many folks and even those that grew up in the workforce before, before me, you know, work was work and home was home. Like there was this very distinct line drawn between what you do and how you earn your living and then the rest of your life. And it was, there was an expectation to keep it separate. And I think as technology has continued to advance and, you know, social media and the mobile phone and now email on our phone and Slack and, you know, just the litany of available technologies of how always on we are and it's virtually impossible to escape work or home no matter where you are uh, i think has offered us this sort of new look new opportunity to realize that well why do we keep our home life and our work life so separate and is that even realistic if you're struggling at home, are you going to be your best at work? If you're struggling at work, are you going to be your best at home? Whether you live alone or you live with a family or roommates or whatever, um, I think this idea that we can easily segment our lives and expect to compartmentalize, at least for me, and I know I'm not alone, was is really, really difficult. Um, I like integrating who I am with one I with what I do. In fact, like I feel so blessed and lucky that so many of the things that are that I just have passion for, like music, like connecting people. I've been able to find a way to create a business around that. And it's not without its challenges, but you know, it's also taken me uh, a lot of years to figure that out. Um, so I think this opportunity that exists to create more meaningful connections with our colleagues at work is a massive opportunity. And the data that supports why it's such a good idea is bountiful, you know, whether it's engagement data, uh, you know, how teams can perform better if you have a best friend at work, the joy that it adds to our life, the health benefits, the wellness benefits, and how all of that can trickle into 
better business performance because you've got teams that enjoy being with their teammates and uh, they're operating because they feel good. They're healthier, both mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Like it's just, there's a lot of upside. So um, yeah, I'm just excited. I think the, the pandemic it was awful, right? It was, there were so many negatives to what we all went through and there have been some amazing uh, positive upsides that I think are now available to all of us to take advantage of. And I believe one of those is finally putting to bed this idea that, oh, well, you're not really supposed to, you know, be close friends with your colleagues or you got to leave your personal life out of work. Uh, I don't know. I just don't agree with that. I think it's a fool's errand. So what inspired you to, to build out music and integrating it with you know, employee satisfaction and productivity? Was it prior to COVID, were you thinking this, or was it really where COVID happened, it hit home, and then it inspired you to, to come up with this platform that, that we'll dig into? Yeah, so it was, and you'll be able to relate to this uh, in a big way because I know you're part of an EO forum. So I joined an entrepreneur's organization, uh, acronym EO forum back, I think it was late 2016 or 17. And uh, for those that have no idea what I'm talking about, it's a peer-to-peer -peer forum. And uh, it basically brings together in a regional area, you know, founders and entrepreneurs and people who believe in the peer to peer learning format where you get grouped together with people that are building businesses in different industries at different stages of growth. And you can learn from one another. Oftentimes, if you're a founder or a CEO or an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily have a group of people that you can go to, to get advice from, to learn from, to share your learnings with. And so I think EO has done a really, really good job as, and there are many organizations out there that do it, but in particular, I joined an EO forum and at my very first meeting, I was notified by essentially the acting CEO for that year. We call that person, the moderator that I was going to be delivering my lifeline and the lifeline, it might be called something else in other venues, but a lifeline essentially is sharing with the group, the story of your life. And the advice that I was given as I was preparing what I was going to share was Brian, the more real and genuine and vulnerable you are about the life you've lived, the quicker you're going to build this deep level of trust that will help you to maximize both the value you can give and the value you can receive from the other members of the group. Because eventually, if you stick with us long enough, we're going to learn everything about you anyways. So you might as well jump into the deep end of the pool. So I did. And as I went through that experience, it blew me away that I was able to really, really quickly develop you know, this, this deep level of trust with this group that I didn't see regularly. We only meet once a month. And so the idea started to percolate with me and one of the other members of our group. Uh, his name's Jeremy Goki, great guy, West Point grad, uh, engineering mind. So a very sort of reserved, introverted personality type, not to label them, but different from me. I'm a bit more outgoing, gregarious. And, uh, He's like, hey, do you ever think that the corporate world uh, would find value in a lifeline style experience? And I just, I start, I kind of took a step back. I'm like, ah, oh, it's really interesting. Like teams, you know, one of the most, if not the most important ingredient to high performing teamwork, high performance teamwork is trust. How do you develop more trust? Well, connection certainly necessary to build trust. And would lifeline sharing, life story sharing help do that? And, you know, at the end of the day, we were both really hesitant because we just didn't think that the timing was right. And frankly, the adoption at a large scale would be there. So this is all pre-pandemic. Um, I remember one day, uh, about a handful of months before the pandemic, we were sitting around at a forum meeting and it ended and we were hanging out, having a cocktail. And there's a Bluetooth speaker that was just kind of on in the background. We were listening to some tunes and chatting and laughing and whatnot. And a song came on 
And every single one of us in this really beautiful serendipitous moment shared a story from our life that that song evoked. And so Jerry, got to, and I, what, 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 what was the song? You've got to let the listeners. <laughs> it was an REO Speedwagon song uh, and it's called Take It on the Run. So uh, for those that don't know REO Speedwagon, they got a great catalog of music, but uh, they're a bit of a 70s, 80s rock band. Uh, classic rock. It, it'll, it'll be in the show notes. You can Spotify it. <laughs> That's a cool band name, by the way. R-E-O Speedwag. I just think it's a killer band name. Anyways, um, so every one of us share a story about like, where were we in life when R-E-O Speedwagon was, you know, kind of the, the hot band. <laughs> Obviously, we're a heck of a lot younger when we were listening to it more, more regularly. And so Jeremy and I kind of look at each other. We're like, huh. I wonder if music could be like this elixir or this trigger that could make everyone, whether you're outgoing or shy, help connect with life memories. And then because music is such a easy, safe, relatable, universal, fun art form that has touched all of our lives. Like I've never met anybody that hates music. Like, I think it's an impossibility to hate it. There are certainly folks like you and I that can't live without it, but I don't know anybody that hates it. And so it was this idea of, could we marry music and memories as a mechanism to make this lifeline idea more accessible? So boom, the pandemic hits as we're you know, kind of toying around with this. And so we decided to give it a shot and thinking and having no idea if it was going to work, but thinking that now that people are at home, they're all connecting through video, or at least most people were, and God bless our frontline healthcare workers and our retail folks and all the folks that, you know, were risking their safety and their lives to serve all of us. But most folks were working from home. And so it seemed like this great idea that, oh, maybe we could deliver this as a virtual kind of a team building experience. People are longing for connection. Could this be a cool way to deliver something innovative and powerful that would have lasting impact? And so that was in the summer, late summer of 2020. And here we are about three years later, and we've got this really, really cool business that uses music to evoke memories and help colleagues in a workplace more deeply connect with one another and build better relationships, leading to more trust, more connection, more safety. And all of that recipe adds to higher performing teams. And, and if you think about the EO, the, the, within a forum, you were talking about really letting go. And they talk about, for those of you that, that aren't aware of fully how forum works is trying to get to that 5% being vulnerable, both personally and, and professionally. And so, you know, the, the hard part is of doing that in a workplace, because how vulnerable do you want to get? And so I think a forum type thing is very difficult. But then in, in when you, you know, take the music, and you then have them and We'll go through a little bit of how it all works, but you have the music share their experiences, both you know, positive and negative. Everybody has those experiences. It does make you vulnerable. It does shed light into something that you've been sitting next to this in you know, your fellow employee for three years or Zooming with them. And you only maybe know surface level, right? Because people don't like to be vulnerable or there are those introverts that aren't gonna, people are gonna steal the stage all the time and then they're gonna be in heat. You don't know who that person is. So that's kind of taking the two and, and making it where it's a more relaxed setting. That's really smart, you know, really genius in that end. Oh, I appreciate um, that. I, I could tell you it was in many ways accidental. Um, but now in hindsight, the gift that it is, I mean, music is a universal language that everybody understands. It just is. And what's been really, really cool is we've done a lot of work with companies that have global employee distribution. So they may have teammates in India or in Australia, the UK and Germany, here in the States and Canada, Mexico, you name it. 
and the music that they grew up with is different. But I will tell you, the emotions of what music does to all of us is universal. Those things that are deeply personal to each of us and how music connects with us is universal to all of us. And that's been just so much fun to be a part of. So as you as you've been growing Anthem, you know, well, for, first up, where did the name I always like for companies and names? How did you? How'd you come up with the name of Anthem? Yeah, How did it resonate with you? Yeah, that was not the original name. So the original name of the company was Life Tracks. Uh, you know, the tracks of your life. And tracks had a cool kind of music element to it as well, right? Track one, track two, so on and so forth. And uh, when we went to file for the trademark of the name, uh, the trademark office came back after a few weeks or a month or two and unfortunately denied the trademark because there was a company out there spelled the same way that uh, was confusingly similar in their business model. And so they denied it. So we're like, damn. Um, so we, was, we were early enough where, you know, changing the name wasn't too, it certainly wasn't going to jeopardize the success of the company at all. Um, and so we were brainstorming a bunch and, you know, one of the, or earlier ideas was Anthem, but we just chose Life Tracks. So we revisited Anthem and the way we spell it, we were able to, it, there was no way we were going to get the, the, the proper spelling, A-N-T-H-E-M.com or any, dot or any of that. It wasn't going to happen. And so by adding the Y at the end instead of the E, uh, it kind of brought in uh, or at least reminds me of the word rhythm and how rhythm is spelled with Y being the only vowel in the word. Um, so using anthem with a Y at the end. And the other thing is, is like, as you think about just the word in general, like you're building your life's anthem. What's the anthem of your life? What are the memories, the lessons, the stories that make up the anthem of your life? And then you know, what's the music that is a part of that anthem. So it felt like, like, I'm so happy we got declined on the original name. Yeah. Uh, Cause I think anthem's a much better name, but maybe I'm just biased. Yeah. I don't know. You know. On a side note, I had a very similar experience in 2015 when I rebranded Baintree. Baintree is a street I grew up on in Cleveland, B-A-I-N-T-R-E-E. -E, and we had gone out and done trademark and already done the marketing material and all this. And we got Good old Bain Capital. I got this huge packet, of 17 <laughs> attorneys, and they're like, you can't use it. I'm like, but the street I grew up on. And so my dad actually said, he was, I was bitching at him and like, what are we going to do here? And he goes, why don't you change the I to a Y? And so I drew it up on the whiteboard. And I looked at it and I'm like, you know what? That's unique. It's different. So we went back and they allowed it. I actually, well, I can't get into it. But anyway, it worked out so much better for us because it is a differentiator. You know, for me, that has the meaning where I grew up, but now the why separates us from everything. So everything works out. Yeah, I love it. And supposed to. Yeah, there you go. And we're fellow, I guess, why brothers in that respect. Yeah. Look at us. And you why scouts, it. the whole, it all comes back to the why. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Former, former uh, ex work experience for you. Back yeah, then. yeah. Uh, so, so 2020, you guys, did you roll it out? Did you have like your first, besides the EO form that you did it with, uh, who, did you have a guinea pig of who was going to be the test and see if this thing is actually, I think it has legs, but is it really going to work? And are people going to, is it going to resonate with both the leaders of companies and all the team members and stakeholders? Yeah, we did. So we had no idea if it was going to work. So we ran an experiment and uh, between Jeremy and I, we extended invitations to you know just a bunch of folks from our respective networks uh, to join us for a Zoom meeting. And we got RSVPs from like, I don't know, 30, 40 people, whatever the number was. And we once we got the RSVPs, we set the date and we said, hey, uh, as a little bit of pre-work, uh, we want all of you to come to the meeting with three at least three memories from your life and the song that represents or is connected to each one of those memories. And we didn't give them any context as to why we just asked them to kind of have that ready in just an analog format, or even just, you know, kind of tattoo it on their brains. And, uh, and then what we did is we 
kind of did a little bit of a presentation sharing what our idea was. And then we broke up all of those, you know, 30 or 40 people into small breakout rooms. And the way we organized the breakouts was purely random, hoping that when you randomize breakout rooms that, you know, some of the folks from Jeremy's network got mixed up with some of the folks from mine. And so people would hopefully be in a breakout with a total stranger. And the instructions we gave was, we just want you all to see if you can kind of crack through the normal bullshit water cooler talk and jump right into getting to know one another using music and the stories that they represent uh, as a mechanism to do that. So start the fire, break the ice, whatever you want to use. And, uh, and they did it and we set them off. And then Jeremy and I were just, it was like nail biting for a half an hour as they were in their breakout rooms. We're like, shit, I hope this is going to work. And to a person, when they came back and we had a big debrief session, it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, I remember it so vividly where every single person was like, that was the coolest experience that I've, I've had in meeting somebody new. Like there was no weirdness. We were able to get real quickly. We were able to find commonalities, whether it was music that we all liked or stories and experiences that, you know, were in some way similar, or you just were able to learn about who people are so much more quickly. And it's, you know, we've all been to events and conferences and we wear our lanyard and it's got our name and typically the company we work for and our job title likely for any kind of a business event. And oftentimes, I think conferences and events immediately frame people that that becomes our identities. It's like, I meet you, shake your hand, I immediately look at your land, lanyard, and I'm like, oh, Andrew Rafal, Baintree Capital, uh, founder and managing partner, or whatever your title is. And it's like, oh, so what do you do? And we immediately assign identity to what you are, not who you are. And so when we were getting that feedback from everybody from the experiment, they're like, I was able to get, these are all business people, but we didn't talk business at all. We talked about who we really are through our songs and our memories. And so it seems so duh in hindsight, like, well, of course it's going to work. How could that not work? I mean, again, music's a universal language. It has touched all of us and storytelling is timely, timeless, it's everything. And so that combination, that recipe, it's just, it, it, it's potent, man. It's super potent. So that 30 minutes that you were waiting, were you in these rooms at all? Or were there two of you just sitting? Okay. So what were you listening to? What was the music that was on while you were waiting those 30 (laughs) minutes while you're sweating and thinking all the bad things that are going to happen and what a horrible idea this is. What were you listening to? We weren't listening to anything. We were talking to one another, freaking out for 30 minutes. Like, oh shit, if this isn't going to work, what are we going to do? You know, it was, uh, yeah, uh, there was no music going on in the background for us. It was all sitting on pins and needles, freaking out. So now you're off to the races. You see in real time, it works from people from all different networks. And they're like, this is unbelievable. People are opening up. What happens next? Now you know, okay, I got an idea that's viable. I think it's, it's got some legs to it. Where, where do you take it next? Is it then going to these smaller businesses or are you going bigger? What did that look like? Yeah, so we raised a little bit of money because one of the things that we knew we wanted to do was to have a technology platform that could catalog these memories and these songs so that a team, uh, when they get together, you know, team sizes... It could be a small company of, you know, a dozen people, or it could be a team of a dozen people. When you put people into breakouts, uh, because, you know, time, of course, matters tremendously. You can't spend a ton of time doing this kind of team connection or team building all that often. Uh, It's certainly not something you can do weekly. Um, And so what we do is when we put people into breakout rooms, we wanted to have a way to have a technology platform that would create a private group for everybody on the team so that the people that I wasn't in a breakout room with, and I didn't get a chance to hear their stories or review their songs that have been a part of their life that have made up some of the soundtrack of their life, that I could go check it out and kind of familiarize myself with my teammates. So it's almost like an employee directory of sorts, like the org chart, but 
instead of, you know, name and, and job title, it's like name. And here are the stories that have mattered to me and the songs that have been a part of those stories. So just a really human way of learning about your teammates. It's like the other side of LinkedIn, really. Um, and so we built a technology platform, a really sort of crude V1 of it. And then it was leveraging our networks and reaching out to folks that we know that were leading teams and saying, Hey, are you, is your, and, and mind you, we're now, you know, six months into the pandemic and people, I think we're starting to burn out on virtual escape rooms and zoom happy hours and trivia games. It's like, you know, and no disrespect to playing a game or doing an escape room. Like those are all fine and good, but we got really interesting feedback of like, a lot of folks don't enjoy that stuff because they're not competitive or frankly, they are shy and introverted. And the idea of, you know, uh, competing against your teammates is just like organ rejection. They don't like it. And so music became this thing that was very appealing and inclusive to everybody. Uh, and what's also really, really cool is uh, even for the most reserved folks who don't want to talk about personal stories from their lives, they can just talk about the music. Like there's no requirement that you have to divulge something that you're not comfortable divulging. So you don't have to share if you don't want to share. Uh, we've worked in a lot of different privacy elements to the platform, the technology platform itself. So it just gives everybody the option to participate at the level they're most comfortable. And that sort of minimum level of participation is just talk about music. And that's easy. Everybody can do that. Uh, and it just, the, the magic of what happens even at that level is really, really cool. So we started going after businesses, big and small, industries across the board. Uh, and, uh, and here we are three years later, still doing it, delivering these really, really cool experiences. And it's evolved where we were exclusively virtual for reasons that hopefully seem obvious to most, but now we do a ton of in-person work and uh, man, doing this thing in person is even more fun because there's just no substitute for being in the same room with, with your teammates and listening to tunes and sharing the stories that those tunes represent. It's just, it's impossible for it not to be really awesome. And the data that you're seeing in these three years in is, um, are you seeing where people's experiences that they're bringing up, are they all over the board, both happy experiences and just fun experiences and sad is a mixed bag in, in regards to what you're seeing? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it is a total mixed bag. There are folks who will stay very um, neutral and talk about uh, things that are like your everyday experiences. There are people who will get into, you know, and focus only on like highlight reel kind of experiences, winning a, being on a winning sports team or being the first to graduate from their family uh, or first go to college or meeting their future spouse or life partner, or welcoming children into the world and being a first time parent. And then you get the really emotionally challenging memories that music immediately, um, uh, it's just so connective for, for, for people. And that could be, I mean, I've, I've seen and heard stories over the years of, as you might expect, losing a loved one, losing a friend, uh, being diagnosed with uh, a, a serious illness, uh, losing a pet, having a miscarriage, um, feeling that when you were, you know, nine or 10 years old, your parents got divorced and you thinking it was your fault. Uh, I mean, it's been some, it's, it is powerful what I've had the privilege to see uh, and read and learn about folks. And also just I'm amazed at how much we all carry around with us that for one reason or another, we are very apprehensive to share. And I actually can understand why we're apprehensive to share certain things, but when people do open up and share it, it changes the dynamic of your relationship instantaneously. You can't look at that person the same way again. And it starts to add detail and explanation and appreciation for why they are who they are. And so you see this really generous benefit of the doubt begin to emerge where we might have previously 
been incredibly judgmental or come up with our own narrative as to why so-and-so is such an asshole. But now it's like, wow, I had no idea. And the dynamic of the relationship changes in a second. And now it's a whole new level of safety and inclusiveness and understanding and appreciation. And it's hard to quantify, which is a, it's, it's hard. It's hard to quantify. But if you take a step back and just apply a little bit of logic to it, any leader can see that, wow, that's going to matter. That's going to make a big difference in how we operate as a team. And, and with that, have you, what, what type of results have you seen from the leaders telling you? Has it increased productivity? Has it increased the empathy factor of we, oh, this person's always late and I'm just so mad at them. You know, just the little things that the workforce happens, right? When you're dealing with 15, 20, 30 people, life happens. And what have we seen from the standpoint of both the leaders, but then also interviewing and, and talking through with the, uh, just the regular team members. And yeah. The yeah. What's yeah we've, benefits? we've been collecting a tremendous amount of feedback and we get positive indications around people staying longer, uh, around the level of trust that exists within a team that might not have been functioning at its highest level and how that begins to, uh, escalate in a positive way, of course. The level uh, or the the feeling of belonging and inclusiveness, um, employee engagement, which is a metric a lot of organizations uh, are tracking, uh, the openness of communication and how much more willing people who may have never been one to offer up their ideas or suggestions are now feeling like okay, my I can share my voice. I'm feeling more comfortable to share because I've learned more about everybody on this team. Uh, so it's it's a lot of those indicators, which has been just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. That's that's awesome, yeah. Because in today's world, especially, is culture is such a key component of retaining and hiring the best. You know, it's different than it was we, we talked earlier, like from us starting out, where it's just like you grind it and nobody cares about you. Uh, necessarily think that was the right move, how they did things in the 80s and 90s and even before were just the number and the big the big boss man or gal comes around and doesn't give a crap about you, but you know, punching the clock and nobody cared, right? People stayed loyal because they had a pension that they had to stay loyal. So it's definitely flipped on itself and culture's important, and team building and all those things that business owners and a lot of people listen to this podcast are business owners and we struggle with how do we make our culture better in today's time? Because it sometimes isn't just about the pay. It's about what's my purpose? Why am I coming to work every day? Do I, do I like these people that I work with every day? And a team building maybe does it, but then it's just a lot of it, like you mentioned, is surface level type stuff, right? We're yeah. just kind of going through the motions. Does, have you seen the, the, uh, the team members that are leading teams, are they being vulnerable too? Are they letting their guard down? And you know, maybe they show this Teflon every day at work. And have, have you seen that happen where now they become more of a person to the person that they're leading and not just this person who's directing them? That is that is exactly where it has to start. It has to start with the leader. Yeah. If, it, if it doesn't, it doesn't take. Um, which has been, I think one of the just big, like, I am so thrilled that we decided instead of trying to sell this as kind of an enterprise offering that we went at a much more bottoms up approach and connected with functional team leaders, you know, the VP of this department, the VP of that department. And what's amazing, uh, is that a, it, it's such a binary filter. Like when we explain, and I have the opportunity to share with a team leader that we're going to help you build deeper, more meaningful relationships amongst your team members using music and life memories as the mechanism to do that. They either light up because they just think it's the coolest thing ever, or they retreat because it's just flies in the face of they're unwilling to be a bit more vulnerable and share more about who they are. And so it makes the, the whole adoption process really, really cut and dry, which is great. 
I don't have time to convince the unconvincible. And frankly, I'm not, listen, if this isn't your thing, then don't do it. You're, you're not going to like it. So if the leader isn't willing to open up, share his or her excitement around, you know, this kind of an activity and then invite others in because they're willing to lead by example and be the first person to share a story and share a song that uh, the team doesn't know about them, uh, then it's not going to work. And so it has to start with the leader. And I, 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 I won't engage with uh, any team if the leader's not on board, like fully. Yeah. And, and you would think that in today's world, that's dinosaur type thinking. And probably in three to five years, the team, you know, maybe there's going to be a few that survive, but it's, you're not thinking that way or outside the box. It doesn't have to be following the anthem way, but being open to these ideas, there's a, uh, I mean, I guess there's nothing you can do. You can lead them to the water. You can't make them drink it. But like when we chatted yesterday and I knew a little bit about it over these years, but chatting with me and, and Lexi is just, I mean, fits perfectly with what we're trying to continue to build here. Not to mention that my team loves music and we are pretty open, but I think this will uncover even more. And starting with, with me not being you know afraid to, to be vulnerable and, and things of that nature. So, you know, we're a team of 10, but you know, I don't think it matters team of 10 or team of 50, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. I don't think size has anything to do with it. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting. There, there is, I often wonder, uh, and I get asked from time to time, like, how do you prevent or, or sort of um, moderate for somebody oversharing? It's like, well, you know, people are usually pretty good. And well, what if somebody shares a story where the, where the rest of the team's like, wow, I had no idea. And it kind of shocks them. To me, and especially given a number of factors, like the growing epidemic of isolation and loneliness that's sweeping across this country and across the world and all of the mental health challenges that the world is suffering from. Like we, we all need help. And if we can't get it from the people that we spend the majority of our waking hours with, that might be the only group of people we have the option of getting the help from. You know, people may not be able to rely on their families. Maybe they don't have a huge group of friends. I mean, the data is certainly pointing to that a lot of people are feeling very lonely and very isolated. And so your colleagues might be the only people that could prevent somebody from, you know, taking a drastic measure or wallowing in depression. So I don't know. It's a really interesting question and I wrestle with it, but I think there's way more upside than there is downside to it. And if people are reaching out and sharing stories, it's likely because they, they probably want someone to listen and, and need a, a shoulder to lean on. And wow, what an honor and a gift and an opportunity to be there for somebody. And if it's in the workplace, okay, let's figure out then how to do that and do it in a respectful, professional way. But like to attempt to outlaw it or just completely keep it out, I don't know. Uh, it's it's an interesting conundrum, but one that I think has a lot more upside. And mental wellness is definitely becoming more of a focal point now, both outside of work and in work. And I think that's only going to get better and better as yep. you know people are going to and, and not afraid of therapy. You know, whether it's one on one therapy, whether it be you know utilizing something like this with Anthem. I can even see it where it's is uh, you know even like a larger extended family where you're like disconnected. There's a lot of families that are disconnected. Imagine being able to bring back families together that have had some issues over the years. You know, we deal with a lot of family dynamics on the, the, the wealth and the planning side. And sometimes it's in, even personally got some, not that, that, you know, you just see, how does this, how do they not talk? And could this be a way to get families coming back together too? So I don't know. It's, could, who knows, could work, but you know, it's just the dynamics of families are a little bit different. Yeah. I think the workplace application of what we're doing, it's just, it's where we started. Right. And it, and there was a really significant need in the corporate world during the pandemic, hands down for connection. And while a lot of organizations have now adopted a hybrid model, 
Uh, some are going back, you know, five days a week and some have stayed fully remote and are continuing to take advantage of, you know, the opportunity to hire the best talent, no matter where they live. And I'm not prescribing what any company should do. You do what's best for you. If you want to be in the office five days a week, great. If you want to do hybrid, great. If you want to do fully remote, great. I, I, I it's, I'm indifferent. Um, I think creating connections is universal to all of those environments. And so the workplaces where we started, wherever there's an opportunity for a group, big or small, if building more meaningful relationships, more open communication, deeper levels of trust, if those are important to whatever outcome that group is looking to achieve, we have a recipe that gets at that. Maybe it needs to, you know, adjust here or there. If it were in a family, for example, as you describe, you know, a family that might be having some family challenges and some dysfunction where this could be a mechanism to bring them together. Sure. Maybe it could work. Um, I think it could, I don't know exactly what it would look like, but we've had opportunities uh, at Gonzaga University, at West Point, at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where we've done new student cohort sessions. Students who are enrolling in a class uh, and the professor's like, listen, I am a big believer that if I can create community within my students, they'll have better educational outcomes. And so we've had opportunities to use our recipe in higher ed. We've done it with nonprofit boards where you got people that are from different companies that come to devote their time to support a cause as a board of director member uh, or as a board member uh, for a nonprofit. And we use it for you know board enrichment, board connection, where they're not on the same team, but they kind of are because they're there to support uh, the CEO and the staff and the mission. We've had some cool opportunities in startup accelerators where CEOs and startup founders are looking to accelerate the growth of their business and the probability of it surviving. And they go through a three month or a four month or a six month program. And they don't know the other founders at all, but they're gonna be in community with them for the entirety of the program. Well, let's help them yeah. all learn about each other in this really cool way. Uh, Cause they're gonna learn about each other's businesses for sure. But what about each other as people? Yeah. That's you know, that's where you, connection comes from. Yeah, I think back to you know, I went to Miami of Ohio and going in and, and, and I was still remember the dorm. You know, I had some friends that went to school there, but I didn't really know anybody in my dorm. And we did all get together in this main room and you know, it's the who are you and the, the blanket elevator speech, you know, speech that doesn't really provide any real interior of who they are as a person. This is, you know, for for kids that are 18 years old, obviously they don't have as much experience as somebody 35, but still music has shaped their life and being able to say, here's one, you know, give us one or two songs and do a mini lifeline. It would have opened things up and we would have gotten, you know, you, you do get to know these people because you spend so much time with them, but imagine that first week being out, okay, this is pretty cool to yeah. see and, and see them beyond their exterior of what they're wearing. And they dress differently than me, but no, they still have the same feeling and emotions. So yeah, the, it, it's endless. It, uh, it's, as long as you have the technology and the platform down, which we did see it yesterday, we saw a test run of it. It is pretty cool, both the uh, ability to sort and search and have the privacy tabs. So we're super stoked here to start it uh, later this year. And uh, you know, we're, we're definitely excited to see the results from it there to continue to, and on our side, to, to build our, our culture. So what's next for you? What's, uh, what's the next three years look like? What are we trying to achieve? Yeah. So uh, we got a lot of feedback from our clients over this sort of experimental first handful of years. And uh, in particular, two themes have emerged, uh, one of which is around new hire onboarding. So one of the things that I think a lot of companies, you know, are the, they might struggle with or they just don't pay enough attention to or they feel like it could just be improved is when they do offer and a new uh, candidate accepts a job, like how do you help them really accelerate their sense of belonging, inclusiveness, and connection to the rest of the, the company, in particular, the team they're joining? Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to do that. So we just launched uh, an onboarding experience and an onboarding product that also has a Slack integration. So really leaning into that. Uh, and second, and this is probably, I, I don't know exactly which kind of organization is going to adopt this most widely, 
my sense right now is those that are mostly or fully remote uh, or have a really big geographic distribution is doing team connection and team building for most organizations is kind of like a once a year thing, once a every, you know, or every, once every six months. I think connection is becoming really, really critical. It's a muscle that needs to be exercised. And so we ended up responding to feedback from our clients where they want to do something more regularly. Well, um, in addition to music, uh, there are other media out there that people have consumed throughout their lives, whether it's the movies we've watched, the books we've read, the television shows that you know we grew up with, the TED Talks that have just blown us away, uh, the travel destinations we've been to, the recipes and the types of food that we associate with certain memories. So there are these other both media-based and experiential triggers that can help us connect to memories that are meaningful and stories and experiences from our life. And so we've ended up building this library of these themed connection experiences that a leader can just kind of pull from our library and use and facilitate on their own and do it in, you know, five or 10 minute little mini connection sessions if they want to do it monthly uh, or they can certainly do it uh, over a half hour or an hour if they want to make it as part of a, a retreat or a standalone event. Uh, so it's just there's a lot of flexibility with what we're designing and have designed to give teams the opportunity to uh, not have to think, all right, what are we going to do next month or what are we going to do next quarter for our team building? And uh, we're done with the, you know, no more top golf and we're not doing a virtual escape room and I'm tired of zoom happy hour. So Lexi cancel all those things we've got planned. <laughs> and I, you know, I've done all those things. I, you know, I have fun doing them cause I'm, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's a personality type thing or a competitiveness thing, but I, I don't mean to speak ill of those. I've just, I learned by listening that yeah. I just never thought about it. Right. There's some people that just, they hear escape room yeah. and they're, it's like, They'd rather go, you know, to the dentist or whatever is the We're thing not, you no, hate no least. escape room here at Baintree. No way. No <laughs> way. Not taking anything away. I mean, yeah, be in, in, so you fall into a passion of people and you love connecting people and music. It's like you're you've you've found the unicorn for for what Brian is passionate about, which is I have totally, I, totally cool. I feel really blessed, man. I really, really do. And, you know, I'm, I'm 51. So it, it certainly didn't come, you know, freshly out of, you know, school when I graduated, it's taken me a while to get here, but I, uh, the way I'm built and knowing what matters most to me and what lights me up is, uh, integrating these things when I can impact people by helping them create better relationships, it makes me feel really, really good. And the fact that music is a part of that, which is a huge passion of mine, uh, both listening to it, going to concerts, playing it as a, as an amateur guitar player, like the fact that that's a part of it, uh, uh pinch myself every day. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. It really is. I feel so lucky. And, and you know, it's not like we have to hit home, home on anymore, but like since COVID seen the, happiness people have of going to music going to shows you know it's whether it's see the taylor swifts or the dead or you got this own band that you're gonna it, it's just we've never seen it like this and the musicians are out there traveling around playing more than they've ever played because they're like well what if it ends again you know they almost took it for everyone took it for granted and now it's like it's back and it's i think that throttle is, is that that's not turning off i uh, god i just, hope not I mean, you just see people happy, smiling. So happy. I saw this. Uh, I love that you brought this up. I saw this. Uh, I think I saw this on Twitter and I took a screenshot of it. It's this cool little um, few sentence. It's not a quote. It's just kind of a, I don't even know what you'd call this. I'm going to read it real quick. The best part of a concert is being surrounded by people that feel the same way about the band on stage as you do. You can turn in any direction and talk to a complete stranger and be their best friend five minutes later. We all know those lyrics. We all paid to see the band. We all bought their CDs. We wear their shirts, their merchandise, everything. We all love that feeling that spreads all over you and the band we all love comes out on stage and plays the songs that saved us when we were down. That is the best feeling in the entire world. And it's, Amen. it's exactly what you're saying. That's, it is. Yeah. 
that's, that's the, the ethos for Anthem right there. I mean, you could whoever wrote that, sign them up. Get them, yeah, get no them doubt. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's definitely interesting times, and you know, music is the thing that's that's helping to put it all together and provide motivation. And you know, I think you were talking yesterday. I was thinking back to like you were talking about your swim days, and you know, I can still one like in the air tonight from Phil Collins comes on. Phil, I was a, a well now, I'm just, but I was a big football guy back in the day, right? And like I can still hear the clunk 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 of our cleats and the smell of the grass and how it felt the emotion with the team that I was part of and everything that, that we did to get to that moment. But it was like that song was always on right before we were about to walk out. And it puts me right back to the, where I was that 17 year old again. Yeah. So that's what music does. Yeah. Music's cool, man. It is, uh, it is the ultimate time machine. It's the, it is, it's what we've got that in the sense of smell, which is a killer time machine as well. But music for me is, yeah the top of my time machine uh, vehicles for sure. Yeah. And that was why COVID was a double whammy for people. It was like, they couldn't connect with anybody and then they couldn't smell and everything. Luckily I never lost smell. I don't know about you, but um, do, you're doing some awesome stuff. We uh, we're so excited to, to watch the growth of what you're doing, what you're building. We're super excited of actually instilling it here at Baintree. And then, uh, you know, maybe we can do after we go through our, uh, our program, our workshop, Maybe we can get on for a quick 15 minute update and go through how uh, the team felt or, you know, maybe even interview some of my team members. So, uh, you know, we're, uh, we practice what we preach over here at the Euro Wealth and Beyond podcast. That's for sure. Um, any last comments before I let you go and get on with your day here in the 118 degree heat in AZ? Oh my goodness. It is warm here. That's for sure. Uh, no, I, I really appreciate uh, the conversation, Andrew. Always a pleasure to chat with you. Grateful for, uh, the opportunity to uh, to be on the show. Grateful uh, for the opportunity that's coming up here in the next uh, couple, three months to uh, do some work with you and the Baintree team. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to it and looking forward to seeing a show uh, with you at some point here and hopefully not too distant future. That's right. Or going to show, seeing you play. And and he, he did uh, indicate he's a Brian's a little bit of a player. He's great. He's a great musician. So uh, maybe we'll put some of that too in the show notes. So there'll be <laughs> listeners way in the show notes to be able to, you know, see some of uh, Brian's work, get, be able to get a hold of Brian and Anthem, how it can incorporate into to your business, as well as uh, maybe a couple clips of Brian on the guitar as well. Uh, well, thanks so much for uh, for being our, our first guest on the relaunch. And uh, I guess keep on keeping on. Yeah, right, will do. Thank you. All right, brother. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Thank you.